welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager with HGA, and I get to be your host today. Today, we are sponsored by Lunatic Fringe, unique yarns for unique people. That's a perfect slogan for them. If you saw them on Spinning and Weaving Week, they gave a great presentation about their yarns and all the things they had to offer. So check those out. Check them out at lunaticfringeyarns.com. We will take questions today. It'll be the last 15 minutes. And again, as always, we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Love your comments, but we need those questions in the Q&A. Today, we have Jennifer Moore. We're so excited to have Jennifer. She has an MFA in fiber arts and she specializes in mathematics, patterns, and musical structures. In double weave wall hangings, her hangings are amazing. She's exhibited throughout the world. She has numerous awards for her work. She's featured in many publications. She's one of those artists that if I had to list all the things that she did, we'd never get to the program. Jennifer's from Santa Fe, New Mexico. She travels extensively teaching double weave, color, and geometric design. Jennifer was invited to teach double weave to the indigenous Quechua weavers in Peru in 2013. And since then, they have, they just excelled at this weaving that had completely gone away because of the Spanish conquistadors. Um, what an amazing thing to have happened. She has a book called The Weaver Studio, Double Weave. She has several double weave videos, online courses, and numerous articles. She'll be teaching at Convergence this summer in Knoxville. Welcome, Jennifer. It's wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much, Kathy. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think this is a really wonderful program that HDA has been doing this year. And I'd also very much like to thank my sponsors, Lunatic Fringe Yarns. Uh, they've been just wonderful to work with. We kind of have a symbiotic relationship and they've been sponsoring my Double Rainbow workshops and providing really wonderful kits for the workshops. So I thank you and them very much. Well, thank you. That was nice of you to say that. So what is your favorite tea? Well, my favorite tea can vary depending on the time of day or the time of year or where I am in the world, but I do have a favorite tea experience. So you're in the British Isles somewhere and regardless of what time of year it is, it's unseasonably cold and rainy. <laughs> and you've been out walking all day, exploring one of the towns or maybe bicycling in the Cotswolds and you're cold and wet and tired and you come across a classic little tea shop and you go inside and you're shown to a table in a cozy corner and after a few minutes a freshly brewed pot of black English tea comes to your table and then a few minutes later a plate of freshly baked scones with little pots of jam and clotted cream come to your table and all is right with the world and you want to stay there forever. A big event over there, right? <laughs> yeah. I like that. Maybe we should start that here. I think it's a good idea. Well, speaking of start, how did you get started in fibers? Well, I was starting my last year of college. This was in 1977 in Portland, Oregon. And I was starting to finish up my work on a self-designed major in art and biology with a minor in pipe organ performance. And the plan at the time was that I was going to go on to medical school and become a medical illustrator. So most of the classes and most of the work that I did was uh, very detailed drawings of plants and animals and human anatomy, mostly in black and white media. So I took a lot of drawing, printmaking, calligraphy, bookbinding, a little bit of painting, but I didn't do much work in color. And I wanted to round out my education and take one class in each of the media that was offered in the art department. So I took sculpture and ceramics and there was an art class or a weaving class. So I signed up for it without any real thought of what that was going to be or what it entailed. 
even though I had done um, your general crafts as a kid and always really enjoyed that, I really had never thought much about weaving per se. But uh, when I went to the class the first day and I walked into the weaving studio, as soon as I saw those rows of looms and the shelves with all the cones and balls of yarn, I just felt like it was where I belonged. And the first time that I got the opportunity to sit down at a floor loom, it felt so familiar to me. It felt so much like playing the organ. It was oh, sort of the yeah. same kind of physical process, except it was in color. And then as I learned about weaving drafts and particularly threading drafts, that reminded me so much of musical notation. So I was interested right off the bat in relationships between weaving and music. So I took that one first class and this was from a woman named Judith Poxon Fox, who just passed away a couple of years ago. And at the time she was working in part in double weave and double weave pickup. And so she talked about it just a little bit that you could weave these two layers of cloth at the same time. And that absolutely fascinated me, but I didn't know enough about weaving at that point to have any idea how that could actually happen. And I could only take the one weaving class at that time because I had to finish up my requirements to graduate. And then a few years passed when I was working and traveling around the world and doing other things. And then I returned to Portland in 1982 and where I was living turned out to be right around the corner from Multnomah Arts Center, a, a local arts center that had lots of fiber classes. And so I signed up for and took every class that I could fit into my schedule and just totally immersed myself in that. And I really, at that point, felt like this is what I wanna do. This is what I wanna be doing. And a few months later, I moved down to Santa Barbara, California, and they had a wonderful uh, adult education department. And I took weaving there. I met my first, signed up for my first weaving guild and really got started. And when I was in the class there, I told my teacher that I wanted to learn how to do double weave and double weave pickup. And she went over to a file cabinet where they had all kinds of materials on weaving. And she pulled out a one page piece of paper that described double weave and how you do it and how you do double weave pickup. And I took it home and I spent weeks <laughs> trying to interpret this and trial and error and trial and error until I finally got it figured out. And once I understood how to do double weave pickup, I just knew that it was my medium my form of creative expression. And then I spent several years basically weaving on my own and starting to do some craft shows and show in some galleries and so forth. But I felt like I wanted to go back to school and expand my base of experience. And so I started looking around at graduate programs in weaving and I contacted the ones that were very well known and looked at all these different possibilities, but I didn't really see the possibility of picking up and moving somewhere across the country because I was married and had a life and so forth. But uh, my ex-husband and I decided we wanted to move back up to Oregon. So I thought, well, I'm gonna look into seeing what kind of programs might be up there. And I knew about the uh, school, the Oregon School of Arts and Crafts. So I called them and told them what I was looking for. And they said, well, we have a program, but we don't offer a degree. And I did want to get a degree, a master's mm -hmm. degree. And she said, but they have a program, a master's program in fine arts in weaving at the University of Oregon. And so I called there and talked to a woman in the art office. And she said, oh, yes, we do have that. And the program is Barbara Setsu Pickett. She is the professor in weaving. And so she gave me her office phone number. I called Barbara and she said, oh, we're right now in the process of looking at graduate candidates this week and we're making our determinations. Can you fly here tomorrow? And I, and I said, well, I guess, and I did. And the next day I was in Oregon and I met with Barbara and 
the next thing I knew, I was accepted into the program to start that fall. Before I had even really decided I was going to do it, I was in. And so I was in and we moved up to Oregon and I started going to graduate school that fall. And I spent the next three years working with Barbara Setsu Pickett. It was a very one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, she was, she is such a weaver's weaver and I was the real weaver of the graduate students. And so we worked really so closely together and it just propelled me to a whole new level in my work. She just knew kind of what, what inspiration, what ideas to feed me. And we've been very close friends ever since and have traveled all over the world together. That's amazing. Just think if you had waited a week, yeah, really. Or 10 days or something. Oh my Yeah, God. life would have been completely different. Oh my gosh. Well, I have a couple of questions along the line. I was curious if you, do you think it would be different if you had taken that weaving class before you took all those other classes? I know you had to take those first, but for some right. wonky reason, let's say you had to take, you ended up taking fiber first. Do you think it would have changed anything for you? I think it very well may have because when I was in that class, and I knew I could only take the one class and there, there was just the one weaving class. And so students could repeat it if they mm -hmm. wanted to continue with it. And so there were some students who were more advanced in the class. And I know that one of them was planning to graduate that year and go on to graduate school in weaving. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't waited so long to learn how to weave. I was 22 years old and I thought, oh, <laughs> I wish I hadn't waited till I was so old to start weaving. <laughs> I like that, yeah. We all felt old then. Well, that's an amazing story. That's just amazing. And I'm gonna ask you more about that. Um, well, actually, let me ask you now. When I'm interviewing some of the, the folks that we've had, the one thing that I've noticed is that there always seem to be these paths that change direction, right? You're, you're on one path and then all of a sudden you take a different shot and then you take a different one. And where do you think those paths, how you got from point A to point B with those? I mean, you already talked about some of that already, but you've done a lot of different things in your life. It's just all that shifting. How do you think all that came about? Well, I've always had a very wide range of interests. And so I've always pursued a number of different directions. And my life has been anything but linear. It has been a very meandering path. And if I were to list for you all the different types of jobs I've had in my life, you would have a hard time believing that it was one person who had done them all. And some of them were real left field kind of jobs, like why on earth did I ever think I wanted to do that? Whereas other ones, I can see how they fit in and tied in directly to where I am now. So um, I started out in music and then I added art onto that. And then I worked for six months in a national park and that got me interested in biology. And so I added biology onto that. And so it just kind of kept going and going and going. And then when I was in graduate school, that's where mathematics came into it. And so, you know, it, it's been a meandering path, but at the same time, weaving has sort of been the thread that ties it all together. And um, a few years ago, I was the keynote speaker at one of the regional conferences, and it coincided with just about the time that I was turning 60 when you do a lot of reflection on your life. And I was yeah, thinking yeah. about this and how my life has gone all over the place, but that weaving has been the continuum. And so the title of my talk was Weaving My Way Through Life, which really was relevant in both senses of the word. So Yeah, that, that's perfect. It's perfect. And I really feel that even things that you do that really you wonder later why you did them, they're all part of your life experience and they all lead to where you are now, so. Oh, that's true, that's true. Well, the first image we're gonna look at is called uh, Chromatic Fantasy. And this was part of your thesis project in your master's program, I believe. So would you talk about the relationship between music and mathematics? You've mentioned that a couple of times already um, that you discovered through this work. 
this was actually the culmination of my thesis work on relationships between weaving and music. Okay. And um, so I put together a proposal to have this be the topic for my thesis work, relationships between weaving and music. And my faculty committee accepted it right off the bat, but I didn't really know how I was going to pursue that. Uh -huh. And so I looked at it from a number of different directions. And I started thinking about how with my background in pipe organ, my favorite composer for the pipe organ was Johann Sebastian Bach. And he worked very mathematically. He embedded a lot of number patterns and puzzles into the way he composed music. And so I thought that this was a good way to tie the two together. And that's where I started studying things like the golden proportion and symmetry patterns and so forth. So um, I was in the process of reading a book about Bach in his life. And towards the end of it, it mentioned a piece of his called the chromatic fantasy that he wrote for the harpsichord. And after I finished the book, that title kept kind of popping into my brain and nudging me. And finally, mm -hmm. I thought, what is it about this that I keep thinking about it? And I realized that the word chromatic has a double meaning. It refers to color, to the color spectrum. And in music, it refers to using all of the whole and half notes of the musical spectrum. So that really intrigued me, that correlation between the musical spectrum and the color spectrum. And I decided that I wanted to weave a chromatic fantasy. And I hadn't even heard the music at that point. So I went out and I got a copy of the sheet music and I bought a recording of the music. And I looked at the music and it's just one note played at a time. There's no chords, there's no two notes played together. But then when you listen to the music, it, the notes are played so rapidly that they all kind of blur together and create this harmonic richness that you hear. And what I did for this, and there was actually a pair of pieces that preceded these five pieces. And so I took out big sheets of graph paper, which is how I design. And I put on the recording of the music and I just listened to it over and over and over and just let it come out on graph paper the way that it felt to me. And um, these pair of pieces had the same colors that you see in this, but instead of the black background, they had a light tan background. And so I wove those two pieces. And if you look, let's say at um, the first two on the left here on the screen, mm -hmm. but imagine that the one on the left is turned upside down so that the solid colored areas are on the bottom. That was how I had designed the, the two original pieces. But when I put them together after they were off the loom, it looked too much like a landscape, like a mountain range with the sky above it. And so I turned one of them upside down and then it looked like music flowing from one piece to the next. And then I started thinking about how colors are impacted by other colors that they interweave with and are surrounded by. And so I tested out my colored spectrum that I was working with with other background colors. And when I used black, it turned into a very bright primary spectrum. The original colors, the cones of yarn are a very toned down sort of autumn based colors. So I decided to weave the piece again with a black background using the same colors for the color layer. And so I set up a warp, I wove the same two panels, but then I started getting more ideas for ways to expand the design. And so I kept tying on more warp and weaving more panels. <laughs> and ultimately I wove these five panels and they're individually stretched and framed. Each panel is about three feet wide and about four feet tall. And after I finished them, I went to a space where there was a big open room and lined them up against a wall in the order that I had, had designed them in. And then thinking about how I had turned the one piece upside down with the original pair, 
I started moving these around and changing positions, turning pieces upside down. And no matter what I did, the design worked. It fit together and flowed from one piece to the next. And I thought, wow, there must be 20 or 30 ways of arranging this. And you know, how am I even gonna keep track of what I've done? <laughs> and so what I did was I took a photograph just like this and I went and made a whole bunch of color copies of it. And then I cut them apart into individual pieces. And then I could have them all in front of me on a table and just move them around and play around with it. And I thought, well, how many ways are there of arranging this? And so I worked out the formula for five pieces with two different orientations. And it turned out that there are 3,840 ways to arrange these five pieces in a row. So I was playing around with this just in front of me on a table and it gave me an idea to make a flip book. And so I ended up making a flip book with two rows of five. So each of the 10 possible images and each position had a stack with each of the 10 images and these all were hinged and could flip over. And so with this arrangement with 10 stacks of the 10 images in each stack, there are 10 billion possible combinations that you can create. So then um, I was still at this point, I'm in my last couple months of graduate school and trying to get finished up. And my brother gave me this idea that what I really needed to do was make a computer animated video of the Weavings Dancing to Box music. And we happened to have a computer animation department at the school. And I thought this idea was completely crazy. I was barely marginally computer literate at this point. But I went because, you know, I have to do what my brother tells me to do. And I talked to a woman in the department and I told her this idea, hoping she would tell me not to do it. But instead she said, oh, that's a great idea. And I'll be happy to sponsor you in an independent study. So the next thing I knew, that's where I was basically living day and night. And so I scanned the images into the computer and recorded the music into the computer and ended up recording, um, doing an animation of the weavings, three rows, five across on the screen. So I had one quadrillion possible arrangements to make, but only did about 2000 of them and um, synced it to the music and so on and so forth. So that was really the culmination of my master's work. Now, is that video still around? Yeah, um, it's, it is around and um, it originally was done, um, oh gosh, I don't even remember what format at that time. And, you know, it's been upgraded over time to newer and newer formats, but um, I have it, it's on the computer and I show it sometimes in guild programs when I talk about this. That's amazing. That's truly amazing. So you were saying each panel was five feet by three feet? Is that what you said? Three feet by four feet tall. So the whole piece put together is about 14 feet across. Because someone was asking the size of your of that piece. Mm -hmm. um, now you're going to be teaching double rainbow double weave class at Convergence this summer. Um, and would you explain first, explain a little bit what the double rainbow double weave is. Uh, so I think that people will understand if they haven't taken the class yet. Okay, so um, double rainbow is a name that I give to this system that I've been working with and developing for about the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. And so it is double weave, uh, two layers of plain weave, and it can be done on four shafts. When you look at the cover of the book on the right, sort of in the center of that montage where you see the larger squares, that's part of the four shaft sampler. And this is a rotation, a systematic rotation of six colors, basically the six primary and secondary colors of the traditional color wheel. And so with those six colors, that rotate from one section of the warp to the other. And with the possible combinations of what shafts can be on the top layer and what can be on the bottom layer, you can intermix 
all of these warp combinations. And then we rotate those colors in the weft as well as you go through this. And so out of the six colors on four shafts, you get a total of 90 unique color combinations. And then on top of that, if you go to eight shafts and have two blocks of double weave, so below that piece, you see those smaller checkerboards, that's two blocks on eight shafts. And with the two blocks, then the combinations literally become endless. And so double rainbow is sort of an overlay of double weave and all these possibilities, the variables of working with the different colors, the different layer combinations, and then the different block combinations all combined together. Well, it sounds fascinating. So now is, is double rainbow in your book? So this is the newer edition of my book. The original book came out in 2010. And at that point I had not started working in this technique yet. Uh -huh. And I started developing Double Rainbow in 2015. And I wrote this book during 2018 mostly. And so I had begun working with it and it's on the cover of the book. So yes, it is in the book but it's gone much further since then. Even as I was writing the book after I had sent um, the manuscript to the publisher and it was ready to go to print, I was saying, wait, 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 I just figured out a new thing. Can we put a little bit more in? And as I've been weaving or teaching this workshop and especially this last year on Zoom with um, the creativity of my students expanding it further and further, it just keeps growing all the time. So. I'm sure it will continue to do so. So is there an addendum or a new book in your future with this or? I don't know. Um, I haven't really thought about that yet. Um, I think it's possible that there could be one more book in my future that focuses on my work and the different ways that I've worked with color and design over the years, uh -huh. but um, I'm not there yet. Well, we look forward to it. That's gonna be amazing. Um, yeah, if, if people are interested in taking your class, um, it's almost sold out folks. So as soon as this is over with, you might wanna jump on there and sign up because it's almost full. Um, the other class you're gonna be teaching is exploring um, Fibonacci and the golden proportions. So these two pieces are amazing. Midnight Expression and Twilight Takata. And these are great uh, examples of the golden proportions and the Fibonacci series. So can you give a brief description? I know they're similar, but they're different. And what attracts you to those? Okay, so the golden proportion is a very important proportion that permeates nature at all levels. Mm -hmm. And so imagine that you have a line of a certain length there is a specific place where you can divide that line into a smaller piece and a larger piece, such that the smaller piece is in proportion to the larger piece as the larger piece is in proportion to the whole line. Mm -hmm. So it creates this harmonic relationship between the parts and the whole. And the actual value of that proportion is 1.61803 dot, dot, dot. It's an irrational number that never ends. And it appears all over in nature. We see it around us all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. And so we tend to respond very favorably to it. And a really elegant example is that we divide into the golden proportion at the navel. And you look at your hand and you look from one fingertip to the first knuckle and then there to the next knuckle and there to the next knuckle. And you're seeing a series of golden proportions. But being an irrational number, it can be a little difficult to work with. So the Fibonacci sequence is a set of numbers where each number in the sequence is the sum of the two preceding numbers. And a number in the series when divided by the previous number gets you something very close to the golden proportion. And the higher you go in the sequence, the closer and closer it comes to the golden proportion. 
So because this proportion appears in the world all around us, it feels very favorable to us. We tend to respond very favorably to it. So it's a great tool to know about in design. And in these two pieces, these were done on the same warp. And the piece on the left, uh, Midnight Express, is the warp is running horizontally. And the piece on the right, Twilight Takata, is running vertically. And the one on the right, I was very much thinking about musical ideas. And the golden proportion also has its um, correlation in music. It relates to the overtone series in music. And I wish I had my pointer here now, but if you focus on one of those vertical columns, maybe three or four to the right of the left side of the piece that is in sort of a orangey pinky color, there's these, um, starting at the bottom, there's these colored parallelograms that start out smaller and move up the piece and get larger and larger as they go. And they are moving up the piece in a golden proportion. And then the black parallelograms are interweaving with them going in the opposite direction in the golden proportion. Okay. Well, one thing I, I love about these is the movement that you got with this how they, you know, they just carry you right into the, to the back, the back of the piece. I just love how much movement they have. They're beautiful. Thank you. Um, now I know mathematics or mathematicians love your work because you were in an exhibit for the math, um, joint mathematics meeting, right? And it's the piece called introspection. And I, for, well, first of all, I have to say, I'm thoroughly amazed and impressed that mathematicians have an exhibit to go with their meeting. I think that's very cool. Yeah. And have you always liked math? Is something that you would be a mathematician if you weren't an artist? Um, well, I have to laugh a little bit because I don't think of myself as a mathematician at all. And I've always loved numbers and I've always loved patterns and I've always loved puzzles. And ever since I was a little kid, I could see patterns in numbers. I could always memorize phone numbers and sets of numbers because I could see patterns yeah. in them. And I would see patterns in words. And so I think I have strong pattern recognition abilities. Mm -hmm. But um, And I did well in math in grade school, the basics of math. But then I started getting over my head. I got as far as high school algebra, algebra and geometry, and that's as far as I went with it. But I've always had a really strong affinity for pattern and for numbers. So um, it really wasn't until I was back in graduate school. And one of the years that I was there, Barbara one day, Barbara Pickett came to me one day and said, one of the math professors, Marion Walter, is going to offer a course next year for the whole year on mathematics in visual art. And I think we should take it together. And I said, OK. And so we did. We took the class together. And that's where I was really introduced to a lot of the concepts that I learned about, that I work with in my weaving all the time now, and that I teach. So even though I work with mathematical ideas, I work with them in a more abstract and visual and intuitive way. I, if you showed me a blackboard filled with formulas, I, I would just glaze over. But um, when I think in terms of visual patterns, that is how I work with mathematics, which ties in beautifully with weaving. Mm -hmm. And this particular piece, um, really ties all these ideas together. It starts with that largest rectangle in the center, which is a golden rectangle, where the two sides of the rectangle, the short and the long sides, are in the golden proportion to each other. And then I use the short side of that rectangle to become the long side of the next generation down, which is built onto the corner, uh, each corner of the biggest rectangle and then continue that process for eight generations of this piece. So it's both a fractal design and it's designed using the golden proportion. That's amazing. 
I have to tell you, it changes how I view this. I mean, I loved it just because it was visually attractive, but hearing you talk about it, it really shifts how you look at it now. And I, that's wonderful. You sound like a mathematician to me. I have to say <laughs> that. You just wrap that brain of yours around that map. <laughs> now, another place that your work appeared is, and I, I, this is, I think you're the second or third artist we've had on that have participated in this. It's the Art in Embassies. And it's a program with the State Department where they put art and have art exhibits in the embassies throughout the world. And they, um, from what I read online, they have like 60 um, exhibits a year. I don't know if that means that the piece stays up for a year or if it's a short-term exhibit. Maybe, maybe you can explain that to us. But um, this other piece called The Awakening, which um, is just beautiful. And I have to confess, I choose the images of the pieces I like the best. I love this. Um, it, would you talk a little bit about how, one, how did it feel to be part of this exhibit, to be included in this? And, and then can you talk a little bit about how you found that program and the exhibit? Yeah. Um, and the work, well, I, we wanna hear about the work too. Sure. <laughs> You know, I, I learned about it from other artists, from other really? weavers, that there was this program. And um, I also worked as a studio assistant to James Kohler for about five years at one point. Wow. And he became involved with this program and went to Iceland and had a piece there that went into the embassy and taught a workshop there. And so learning about this program, I got the background information and I submitted a, an, a portfolio, and I don't even remember if it was digital or by slides or what it was, but I sent in a portfolio and they, I got a letter back saying, thank you very much. We will put that in our database. And each year as there are new ambassadors, they get to look through it and choose pieces that they want. And that was that. And I didn't hear anything from them again for several years. And then suddenly out of the blue one day, I got a letter saying that the new ambassador to Montenegro had chosen this piece as one of the pieces wow. that she wanted to have in the US embassy there. And so that was wonderful. I actually had to go look up where exactly Montenegro was. <laughs> and um, I was very excited and I really hoped that I might get to go visit the piece in place one day, but that never got to happen. So this piece has been to Montenegro, but I have not. And people who work with the embassy came and packed it up and took it away. And it was there for three years in this exhibit. Okay. And a beautiful catalog was printed of the exhibit. And then three years later, it came back to me. So um, it was a wonderful experience. And it's different in every case. Sometimes a piece might be there for a year or several years, or they might purchase pieces. So oh. it just depends on the circumstances. And um, this particular piece is also a really good illustration of some of the things we've already talked about. Um, this piece, the colored warp is a space dyed silk and um, all laid out in the warp for the colors to align the way that they do. And it was woven in three panels on two different widths of warp. And for this piece, I gave myself the assignment of designing a piece entirely using the golden proportion and the Fibonacci sequence. So the width of the side panels is in the golden proportion to the center panel. And the bottom panel is in the golden proportion to the upper section of the pieces. All of the design elements are in Fibonacci numbers. And then going down the center is a Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, again, you start looking at it and it's like, oh, I see it. I see it, three, two, three, that's wonderful. I love that. Um, you've been involved with the, we're kind of shifting gears here now. You're, you've been very involved with the Andean textile arts. And again, going back to Spain and Weaving Week, you gave that beautiful um, talk and video about it. And so we have pictures here of Nelda uh, Kalanopo and you're with some students. So if you would explain to folks what uh, Andean textile arts is and then how you became involved in it. 
Well, Andean Textile Arts is a nonprofit organization that's based here in the United States. And our mission is that we're dedicated to supporting the people and the communities of the Andes with their projects, their efforts to preserve and revitalize their textile traditions. And so um, in addition to um, financial support through our donors, we generally in normal years lead tours to Peru. Um, we also had just started leading tours to Bolivia when COVID sprung up. And um, we offer all kinds of educational programs, including the one you mentioned, which is a recorded program about the work in Peru that they are doing down there. And this is now available for guilds, for us to present for guilds. So for me, I became fascinated with Peru decades ago as I learned about pre-Columbian weaving in Peru and particularly about their work in double weave and double weave pickup, amazing work that has never been surpassed since. Uh -huh. And so it was really, you know, a dream of mine for many years to go to Peru. And I finally got the opportunity in 2010, which I was at Convergence in Albuquerque. My book had just been released. I hadn't had a vacation in a couple of years working on the book. And at Convergence, I learned that there was going to be a first of its kind conference held in Peru called a Tinkwi, a gathering of weavers. And that afterwards, Andean Textile Arts would be leading a tour and visiting some of the communities and going to Machu Picchu and other Incan sites and so forth. And I just felt like this was it, this was the perfect opportunity and my big reward to myself for finishing my book. <laughs> and so I immediately signed up to go to the conference and to go on the tour. And it was an amazing experience and all of it was, but especially visiting the weaving communities and seeing these people doing their work there. I just felt like I want this to be part of my life. I want, I want to continue working with this. And in Santa Fe, we have this amazing international folk art um, mm -hmm. fair market every summer. And I had already been volunteering at it every year and working in whatever booth they needed me in. But after going to Peru in 2010, I started specifically requesting to work in Nilda Kainyapa's booth. And so I've been doing that ever since. And so, in 2012, she was actually staying at my house and she told me that she was planning the next Tinkwe conference for November of 2013. And she said, I want you to come down and I want you to teach 20 of my best weavers from the 10 communities how to do double weave. And I want you to make 20 backstrap looms all set up for double weave and ship them down to me. And I want you to come down and teach them to this group of weavers. And this was an unbelievable honor and an incredible challenge because I had almost no experience weaving on a backstrap loom. I had never set up a backstrap loom, no idea how to set up a backstrap loom for double weave. And they, worked in an entirely different, um, the, the Peruvians prior to, um, you know, the Spanish conquest worked in a different type of double weave than what I do. So I needed to learn that and they don't speak English. So they yes. speak, their first language is Quechua. Their second language is Spanish and I speak very rudimentary Spanish. So everything about it was out of the box for me. And I spent a whole year learning everything that I could. And um, Laverne Waddington really pulled it out for me. And um, she happened to be in Santa Fe right when I needed her. And she showed me how to set up the backstrap loom and create the sheds for double weave. And then I made the looms and went down there. And when I got there and started teaching, I had my instructions translated into Spanish so that I could at least talk to them in Spanish. But they just looked at me like, 
deer in the headlights when I, I mean, it's like they didn't understand a word I was saying. And I thought, wow, this isn't working at all. And so finally, I just sat down and did it. And they looked and watched me do it. And then they sat down and did it. Oh, no, really? That's how they learn. That's how they grow up learning to weave. And they were fabulous students. It was just an amazing experience. And it really came out really well. And they have passed it on. And it's being done there now in just beautiful ways. So a couple of years later, I was asked to join the board of Andean Textile Arts. And so I did, that was in 2015. And so I've been on the board ever since then. And I was able to go down again in 2017 to the third Tinkwe conference and see the work they were doing in Double Weave pick up at that point. And then the last tour that we were able to take was in 2019. And Anita Osterhaug and I got to be the two reps from Andean Textile Arts on that tour. So that was an amazing experience and can't wait to go back again. Now, is the that video informational fundraising both? Um, the video, is it a fundraiser or is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, well, what we do is um, we are available to present it to guilds for a guild program. It's a recorded video, but one or two of us from the board will be on the call to present the video and to answer questions afterwards. And we request a donation to Andean Textile Arts for having this program. So it is a fundraiser, yes. And we're very actively working on raising funds, they've been hit very hard by COVID. Really? And yeah, they, you know, Peru was shut down and they haven't had tourism. They haven't, we haven't been able to have our tours there mm. and the money that that raises and the sales that happened because of that. So we've been working very hard having online auctions and our own textile programs on Zoom to raise funds to send down to um, Peru so that first off, that they can survive, and yeah. secondly, that they can continue to produce their work and continue their programs down there. Well, um, you have a um, another exhibit called Material Meaning, A Living Legacy of Annie Albers, and I think that was out of California, and Cameron Taylor Brown was involved in that. So could you talk a little bit about what Annie Albers means for weaving and what she means for you while you were in that exhibit? Sure. Annie Albers was arguably the most important textile artist of the 20th century. Um, she learned to weave at the Bauhaus School in Germany and um, she met her husband, Joseph Albers, the famous colorist there. And in the early 30s, the Bauhaus had to shut down due to pressure from the Nazis. And they left the Bauhaus and eventually came over to the United States. And they were invited to teach at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And Annie actually set up the weaving program there. And she was the first woman and the first textile artist to have a solo exhibit at the Museum mm -hmm. of Modern Art in New York. So what she did for, for weaving and for textile arts to have them be seen as an art form, it, it, it's un, incalculable and it affects all of us. We really all owe a debt of gratitude to Annie Albers. And so um, there was a lot of focus on Annie Albers and the Bauhaus in uh, 2019, I believe it was, the, this exhibit. And um, there were many exhibits, many programs about Annie Albers. And Cameron Taylor Brown curated an exhibit of contemporary weavers influenced by Annie Albers. And she asked me if I would be part of this exhibit, which of course I was very happy to do. And this is one of the pieces that I had in this exhibit. And we had to write a statement about how we were influenced by Annie Albers. 
And I thought, well, okay, how was I influenced by Annie Albers? And I was introduced to her and her work and her writings in the 80s when I was still a fairly new weaver. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go back and read her books and because I haven't read them in probably 30 years. And so I read her book on weaving again and right there at the very first page, it said, dedicated to my great teachers, the weavers of ancient Peru. And I just thought, there it is. Yeah. That's, that's where that started for me. I didn't even remember that. But um, reading that book and being introduced to her work is where I really started tuning into this amazing work that had been done hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago in the Andes and becoming really fascinated with that work. And I, as I read through her book, I just kept getting one jolt of recognition after another. And it was like, I, I didn't realize how much she really did affect me until I read that again. And it was, it was like everything I read, I, I could relate to in a way that I think about weaving and how I think about <laughs> design. So I think she just sort of, I think I just sort of absorbed her into me and without even consciously thinking about it, um, she became a part of me. Yeah, yeah. Well, just again, to remind people, um, Black Mountain is, was in North Carolina, it's no longer there, but there is a museum in Asheville, North Carolina dedicating um, and has some information about, about the Black Mountain College. And I, it's a part of the tours for Convergence. So if you're going to Convergence and you're thinking about a tour uh, and you want to know where Annie Albers, you know, you might want to check into that. But uh, it was an amazing exhibit. I, I wish it would have gone on longer. And I was so glad to see your work in it. It was wonderful. Well, I read an article that you wrote, I think it was in Hamilton, and you were talking about double weave. And one of your statements, which I absolutely love, I have a list now of all these things, I'm gonna put them in needlepoint and, and put them up on my wall. <laughs> and it said, it's good to keep an open mind and be able to see both sides of a story that is just as true in weaving as in life. Can you talk some about that? I love that. Well, you know, weaving is just rife with metaphors for life. <laughs> we all know that and we use them all the time. But um, double weave, right from the beginning, when I did my very first piece in double weave pickup, I designed the piece, I wove it as I designed it. And of course, you only see one surface as you're weaving and you're rolling it up and you only see part of the piece as you're working. And after I finished it and I took it off the loom, I turned it over and the back side was much more amazing than the front side, than what I had planned. It was much more complex and much more interesting. And so of course it became the front side. <laughs> and I've had that experience over and over with Double Weave where I get these wonderful surprises on the other side, or I decide to turn a piece upside down or on its side, or, you know, displayed in a different way than I had originally planned. And so it really has taught me to be open to what the weaving wants to be and not just attached to my preconception that I had in mind for it to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I feel very much the same way about traveling. Traveling has been a big part of my life as well. And I feel that traveling to other cultures and meeting people in other cultures really opens you up to seeing other ways of life. And when I do that, I try to um, just absorb what I'm mm -hmm. experiencing without judgment and just say, oh, there are other ways of living life and let's just experience this. And other ways of life can be just as valid. And so I feel that travel has taught me a lot of that. And I feel that weaving has taught me a lot about that too as well as um, listening to messages that come to me. I feel that um, we get messages all the time. And if we pay attention to them, if something is saying, pay attention to me, um, you know, think about this and pursue it, 
that it takes you in directions that you might never have consciously gone and that those always end up being the richest experiences. Well, that's amazing. Um, we've got some questions we're going to grab here. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time, but the one thing I wanted to check in with you, you've talked so much about things that you're going to do. Is there anything else you want to share with us that's coming up next for you or have we hit it all already? <laughs> you're well, one busy woman. You have done a lot in your lifetime. <laughs> um, I have a full year of teaching ahead of me next year, including Convergence. And I am really hoping that a lot of it will be in person as mm -hmm. well as teaching on Zoom. And um, I've got projects on all of my looms and in my head as well. So plenty to keep me busy. Several big trips got canceled due to COVID and I hope that they're still gonna happen again. So I hope there's lots of travel in my future too. Well, I hope so too. And I hope it's somewhere near where I am. I can't wait to see some more of your work and hear more from you. Um, we got a couple of questions here. I love this question. This is from Elizabeth. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, but she said, how does your environment influence your design and color choices, specifically New Mexico? Well, it's really interesting because I have been, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in a very different environment. I've lived in many different places, many different states and many different parts of the world, but I have been drawn to the Southwest ever since my family took a road trip to Arizona when I was nine years old. I've wanted to live here ever since. And in some ways, the work that I was producing before I moved here looks more like New Mexico and the Southwest than it does now. My colors then were more those desert kind of colors to a large extent, because that's where I wanted to be. Uh -huh. But living here, this is a really wonderful place to be living as mm -hmm. an artist, as a weaver. It's so rich in the arts. There are so many wonderful weavers here. We have great museums great programs, the cultural opportunities, you, you can't keep up with them all. So um, I just feel so supported here as a fiber artist. And there's just been so many opportunities. I basically came here 22 years ago because my life fell apart in Portland. Everything kind of fell apart at once. And I picked up and moved here. And I landed in the right place. Everything just opened up to me as soon as I moved here. And I've never wanted to be anywhere different other than traveling since then. So I think, um, I think it all plays into my work, but I can't really pinpoint it in a really concrete way, just that it totally infuses my sense of design. I love the open spaces. I love the mm -hmm. architecture. I love the color here. It all has to be influencing me. Uh, next question is, uh, Ramona Abernathy Payne wants to know, are you gonna put your video animation of the five panels on your website? Hi, Ramona. Um, I actually used to have it up on my old website and uh, maybe I'll do that again. I think it oh, might wonderful. be somewhere up on YouTube. But I think when you came to my deal, which was Chattahoochee, I think you played that. I saw it somewhere. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I do a guild program called Chromatic Fantasy where I go through that whole process and I do show the video. So maybe I'll put it up on my website. Sign her up. Sign her up. Um, I'm not sure what. Oh, <laughs> somebody you know has a question for you. Barbara Setsu Pickett wants to know could you talk about your practice of putting on twice as much warp and weaving it, the first according to plan and the second improvising? <laughs> Well, Barbara, thanks for asking that question. Hi. Um, yeah, that's an interesting aspect that I sometimes apply in designing. And I design all my work on graph paper, full size on big sheets of graph paper. And I often will put on twice as much warp as I need for that piece. So uh -huh. it begins with some kind of an idea, some sort of a concept that I want to explore and the colorway that I want to work in. And I spend quite a bit of time in the design process and drawing that all out on graph paper and then put on twice as much warp. I don't know what the second piece is going to be. 
And so in the process of weaving the first piece, of course, you get ideas and things that you might want to try. And when I go, when I finish the first piece and there is enough warp left for another piece, it's like I have to design backwards because all the parameters are already there in the warp. All my colors are there. The layout of my color sections of the warp are there. And I have to come up with a new design to fit that. And so I think it sort of throws me over to the other side of my brain or something like that, but it's a completely different design process. And it's both challenging and often it ends up being the piece that I like the best of the mm -hmm. two. Yes. So it's kind of a challenge I throw at myself to, <laughs> because the first one is so planned out and I know exactly row by row, exactly what I'm gonna be doing. And um, the second one's a surprise. Well, Phyllis Shimlock said, Prospect High School salutes you. Wow. <laughs> Salute you, Prospect High School. Blast from the past. Um, Paula Williams wants to know, what looms do you use to weave on? I have three looms. Mm -hmm. The one you can see behind me is my original H-shaft Gilmore loom, my first loom that I ever got. And um, my beloved my beloved H-shaft Gilmore, who has been through everything with me. And I have an H-shaft Louette Jane table loom that I just, it's pretty new and I just love it. I love working on it. And I have a 32 shaft Louette Megato Compudabi loom. And I use them all. I love them all for different reasons. And I do different types of weaving on each one of them. They all have their reasons for why they should be used. And, um, you know, every type of loom has its strong points as well as its um, less than strong points. And so I really think through every project that I'm going to be weaving, what, which is the best type of loom to use? Mm -hmm. And they all have their place. Well, be before we came on the air and, and started the program, I had told um, Jennifer that I was so aggravated that because it was just so much and we need like two hours to do this. And I know I've run over today, I apologize to people, but I mean, we could talk, I could talk to you forever about why do you use that loom? I just think that's fascinating. And you're the whole spectrum to the very complicated to a table loom. I could talk to you about that forever. And there are questions that we didn't get to today. Some of them, I think you can get um, from the website and um, we're gonna talk some about that, but we do need to stop for today. Thank you so much for being on here. I was so excited that you said yes and you came on. Thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's been really fun talking with you. And I hope that maybe at Convergence, we can sit down and maybe have a glass of wine. And I know, I know, I'll buy things. even. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Again, I do want to thank Jennifer for being on here today. Y'all check out her website. It's amazing. Doubleweaver.com. She's got her classes listed on there. She's got her books. Um, some of this information that people were asking about, um, you know, contact her through her website and maybe she can, you know, give you more information than we can cover here today. Um, but we do appreciate it. And also we want to thank um, a Lunatic French for being a sponsor today. Um, they carry the kit for Jennifer's rainbow double, double rainbow double weave. So if you're interested in um, trying it on your own, if you're going to do the workshop, uh, you can get the, the kit from Lunatic French if you go to their website. Um, they have incredible yarns and kits just and they know color so so well if you ever want to do a color gamp i encourage you to do that they're wonderful they have the best kit for color gamp nobody does a color gamp as well as lunatic fringe check them out at lunaticfringeyarns.com they've been a very good friend to hga thank you if you want to sponsor textiles and tea your business your guild uh, please go online to we and you too can um, choose a future date and be the sponsor um, I want to thank everybody who donated to Giving Tuesday. HH programs such as the Shuttle Spindle Die Time Pop Magazine, COE, Textiles and Tea, they are not completely covered financially by donations um, 
uh, by memberships or sponsorships or even the fees that you pay for the specific event. Your donations to HGA's Fiber Trap help support those programs as well as um, they, they cover our grants, the scholarships, our, our wonderful interns that we have at Convergence. So the income from Convergence provides the needed resource for HGA to operate for two years. That's our operating fund is from Convergence. With COVID and the postponement of the 2020, we, we, our bottom line really was impacted and we've been operating on a loss for three years running. With your help, we hope to meet our fundraising goal for December and have a wonderful ending to 2021. Um, last year, we y'all gifted to HGA $1,348 in 2020. We need to raise $9,500 this month to meet and exceed last year's goal. So for all of you who've already donated, thank you so much. It means a lot to HGA. And if you are, others are thinking about donate, you can either go to our website, weavespendi.org. You can call us at 678-730-0010. And again, we thank you so much. Um, I hope you all had a good afternoon. I enjoy talking to Jennifer so much. Uh, someone talked about how she's genius. Love that mind of hers. Um, next week, we will have uh, Margo Selby will be here for our guest. Um, hope you have a good week and happy tea.